Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. And welcome to Turn the Page. I'm your host today, Jen, and I'm here with the fantastic author of a really exciting new uh, spooky thriller. Could I ask you to introduce yourself and your book, please? Yes, my name is Courtney Gould. I am an author who lives in the Pacific Northwest, and I wrote The Dead in the Dark and my new novel, Where Echoes Die. Where Echoes Die is the story of a girl named Beck and her sister Riley, whose investigative journalist mother has recently passed away. Um, And before she passed, she was obsessed with a small town in Arizona named Backravel, where nothing is quite as it seems. She never got to finish her great story on this town. And so her daughters decide to travel to Backravel, Arizona to see what it was that was so captivating to her while she was alive. But once they get there, they find that Everything is a little different than what they expect. The entire town uh, goes to a treatment center run by an enigmatic man and his daughter, who Beck finds herself very drawn toward. And as Beck gets closer to learning the truth about the town, she also gets closer to learning the truth about her mother and the process of letting go of that memory and moving on. Mm. It is such a gripping story, and I was super impressed, um, particularly with the way that it's paced and with the way that the mystery is sort of like, uh, you know, dribbled out, like at this really tantalizing pace. Um, Before we get too much into the book itself, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, just how you got into writing and uh, your journey from your first book to this one. Because I saw on your website that you are into writing about, uh, and I quote, queer girls, ghosts, and things that go bump in the night. And I think it's all great, (laughs) you know, and so like, yeah, can you talk about uh, how you got into writing about these things? Absolutely. First of all, I I love when people cite that line of the bio, because I feel like that's always the best way for me to grab the attention of the readers that I think would be most into what I write. Um, I wanted to write from a very young age, Um, even when I was younger. um, I think when I was in like, third or fourth grade, my parents got me a typewriter and I would just type little bits and pieces of stories I came up with all the time, never actually finishing anything because my attention span wasn't long enough, but I really was into creative writing. I did classes on it all throughout school. And then when I got to college, I um, majored in creative writing. And through those workshops, I learned a lot more about the actual publication process and how hard it is. And Um, learned uh, to get a thick skin when you get feedback. And I think that from there, I knew that if I can make it through this, then I want to go all the way with it. I want to write and I want to write professionally and I want to share what I write with other people. And so um, from there, I decided once I graduated to write very seriously, I wrote a book um, that was, this is never going to come out. So (laughs) I wrote a book and it was very um, sort of based on, you know, my own life and it was very heavily projection. And it was one of those things where you get it out of your system really early on, um, realize, okay, that's not going anywhere. And so as I was revising it, I kind of sat down and I thought I would rather write a book about like lesbian ghost hunters in the middle of nowhere. Nice. (laughs) And that was when the idea for Dead in the Dark was born. And from there, I just started sort of writing feverishly. Like I would write several thousand words a day. I finished that book in like two months, I think. It was um, such a joy. And I think that for me, not only was I really happy with the product from it, but I also really was cemented in knowing that I wanted to write for a living. And so I um, queried that one. I finished it in like October of 2018, finished it around Halloween time, which felt very fitting to me. (laughs) Started querying agents in early 19, um, found representation with uh, Claire Friedman and Jessica Milio at Inkwell, who are wonderful agents. And we um, went out to Wednesday a little bit after that. Um, Wednesday was my dream publisher because they uh, published Sadie and Courtney Summers was like my favorite author of all time. So 
<laughs> I was very excited about that. Um, and it was, it was a really good process. It was a really good experience. I think with Dead in the Dark, it was a book that came very easily to me and one that I was very proud of. And so it had sort of a smooth journey to publication as well. Okay. And so it was late 2020. Um, we had been in the middle of COVID for a while and um, I had been laid off from my job and was out of work for about six months before I found something else and was thinking, you know, I really don't want to be doing this. I want to be writing. I'm so frustrated with like, obviously we needed to all stay isolated, but when you are isolated, it starts to really take a toll on your mental health. In the midst of that, I also lost um, a couple family members and it was a really difficult time. And I went to my agents and I said, I've kind of got an idea for another book that I'd like to do. And um, it was sort of a combination of a time when I, because I didn't want to fly during COVID, I drove down to visit my uh, dad in Phoenix, Arizona. And so we did that drive and it was just so grueling. And I remember this moment where we were driving out of Palm Springs into like that big desert stretch between there and Phoenix. And I was driving through like the deserts of Arizona at sunset and looking around and I was like, I have to do something with this. <laughs> like this feeling of this like isolation, but also like awe at what's around you. It feels like you're on a different planet. It's incredible. And so I kind of ended up merging this idea of dealing with grief from being isolated and losing so many family members with this setting that sort of gave that same feeling like this wonder and terror at the same time and that was when where echoes die sort of started to take shape for me so um the process with an option book versus selling a whole book to a publisher is that you only need to send the first, I don't know, 50 pages of it with a synopsis of what you plan to do with the rest of the book to your publisher and say, okay, this is what I plan to do with this book. So I had a really strong idea for where it goes die and I had a pretty solid outline, but I sent it in. They were excited about it. We, they acquired it. And as I started really settling into writing it, it became a really intense struggle actually it was very hard to sort of find footing in Beck's head because there were a lot of things that you have to confront when you're basing it on, you know, oh, I'm going through all of this grief. I'm losing these family members and I want to write a book about somebody dealing with that. Then you have to actually write somebody dealing with that and it becomes much harder. So Where Echoes Die took me quite a bit longer than Dead in the Dark. It took me about a full year to, to draft that book. And um, it was really difficult, but I think that's made me love it more in the end that I knew I had to look, work through so much to get to the finish line on it. So I think that where it lands, um, Dead in the Dark was sort of my easy child, <laughs> where Echoes Die was my difficult one, but very fulfilling. <laughs> so. Wow, that is so interesting. And, you know, it it echoes what I've uh, heard from several authors that I've talked to about how, you know, the pandemic really made a lot of people like kind of go inside themselves and write these like really vulnerable, really Absolutely. raw things, you know, and it's been really rewarding to talk pe to people about that process and also just to like read the things that that process created because it really does make for like really engaging art, I think, you know. I'm so glad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would love if you could talk a little bit more about Beck and the sister relationship at the heart of the story because... I think the relationship really grounds you in what is like for a lot of the story, super mysterious and very slippery, <laughs> you know, and like the, this is something I'll want to get into later too, but sort of like the way that time works and, you know, stuff also makes yeah. the story like slippery. Um, but this relationship is so real and so grounded and so nuanced. So I'm uh, wondering if you could talk a little bit about like, yeah, where it came from, how you crafted the dynamic and, you know, maybe also the way that you use two characters to explore uh, grief and how it affects relationships and, and things like that. Absolutely. 
So um, the interesting thing about Beck and Riley from the bat is that um, I have a very close relationship with my younger sister. Um, and so there were certain moments of it, elements of that relationship that I dug into um, my own relationship with, with my sister Carly and just tried to sort of emulate that that dynamic between two people that there's this sort of ease to talking to your sibling but at the same time you want to look out for them and you don't want to let them down and you don't want to cause them any harm but there's an element of it where you feel like when you do something wrong if there's one person that will forgive you it's your sibling and so sometimes we can get into a headspace where we begin to let bad things happen in that relationship knowing that this is somebody who will forgive me which is not a healthy place to get into <laughs> with somebody else um i think for me my dynamic with my sister has always been that i'm sort of the the scatterbrained like <laughs> a little bit less organized and she's very um like type a and has things together and is very practical and pragmatic about things and so I wanted to explore that dynamic, the the messy older sibling and the pragmatic pick up the pieces younger sibling. Um, and they came together, I think, for me very well. Um, and Riley as a character really helped me keep the humanity in the story because as Beck gets further and further into back gravel and starts to lose her footing in reality and starts to drift away, Riley's always there saying, this isn't you, this isn't what we should be doing, we need to get back to, you know, point A, point B, we need to get back to real life. And so I think the the sibling relationship, I've always wanted to write a sibling relationship, and I noticed that most of my writing has only ch or only child characters, just because it's hard to get that dynamic quite right. Mm. Um I remember growing up reading a bunch of books that had siblings and thinking like, oh, I would never talk to my sister like that, or, oh, I would never say that. And so it was a good feeling to get to put my dynamic with my sibling on the page. And some people click with it, some people don't, but mm. I feel like it was very honest to my own experience. It does feel very honest and it feels really honest too um, in the ways that it depicts um how grief, you know, can make you act in ways that feel outside your character or make you question who you are because it re maybe reveals new parts of you and all these different sorts of like issues with identity, you know, that come up with mm -hmm. like big losses and stuff like that. Yeah. And that plays into, I think, in very interesting ways, like the mystery at the heart of this town. Um, so I would love if you could talk a little bit about um, yeah, like what Beck's experience is in this town, because like the way that the story plays with time and how characters experience it and sort of like the lapses and is all so interesting. And it's like, um, it, it really keeps uh, the reader engaged because like, um, I, I feel like the characters respond in ways that like are very relatable, but also because they're in such dire circumstances, it uh, sometimes is also very extreme. I hope that made sense what I just said. In yeah. <laughs> I think for me with Back Ravel, I wanted to explore a place where Beck would end up that would, without getting too into spoilers, would offer her everything that she believes she wants mm -hmm. and she's trying the entire time to understand what the what the catch is because when it's presented to her and it's like you are living in a place where you don't ever have to lose anybody and you don't ever have to um you know worry about going through that grief again and you can just live here and be a part of this community and everybody loves each other and nobody ever has to go away she's thinking okay there has to be a problem with this there can't it can't be like that because that's all I want mm -hmm. um and she's so deep in the grieving process that she's not understanding how unhealthy something like that can be if you're crafting for yourself a world where you never have to be hurt by anything then you're never going to be able to emotionally grow you're never going to be able to to love anything fully if you know you it's never going to leave you and so she she believes because she's so deep in this grief and because it just feels insurmountable and like she can't fight her way out of it, 
she thinks that living in this town where she never has to go through that again would be very ideal for her. And so I really wanted to to craft a town that would appeal to this specific type of person, somebody who has been through grief like that, who is really struggling to come up for air, and to whom a pitch like this would be very compelling. Because I think not everybody would be as intrigued by the pitch of back gravel as Beck is. Mm -hmm. And so I think it has sort of a natural weeding out process to it that Beck is willing to make some pretty extreme choices and changes in her life to get to stay here. And others who wouldn't don't end up staying. And that's sort of how the mystery has gotten to continue like this is that they have, yeah, without getting into too many spoilers, they've yeah. kind of created a situation where they can find the people who would stay here and who would give up everything to be here, mm -hmm. and they can keep those people um, and discard the rest. Mm. It's it's really, um, it's really striking to me because the town is like, obviously, very uh sinister in many ways right but also like it is deeply appealing I think especially for somebody going through what Beck is going through because mm -hmm. it's sort of like you know it's it's a life that promises like no lows you know but mm -hmm. also like doesn't really offer any highs you know exactly and like that's super appealing when you're going through trauma right because like yeah. what you kind of want is like just stability and predictability even if that's like super boring you know yeah New things can mean bad, but they also oftentimes mean something good. And what Beck doesn't realize and what everybody who's in this town doesn't realize is that by avoiding the the bad parts of life, the things that make you sad and the things that that make your life change in a way that you feel really uncomfortable with, is that she's also losing all the other pieces of herself too, and everybody else is. That all of the good things that you loved about your life go away too, because you can't just pick the bad things to go. And so I think that over the course of the novel, the hope is that the reader realizes, oh, this sounds really compelling. And then they start to see sort of the way that it's affected everybody who lives there and the way that they're really sort of husks of the people that they used to be. Um, and is like, actually, that's not for me. <laughs> so yeah, hopefully. I think it accomplishes that for sure. <laughs> Um, I'd love to talk about, um, maybe like, uh, the way that the book is written, because something that I love, and this might seem like just super specific, but, um, like you, you use like the close, uh, per, like close third person, uh, super well here. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I always really love that because I think in some weird ways, it can feel like more intimate than the first person, you know, and I'm wondering if there was something in particular that guided your decision uh, in how to tell the story. Well, the funny thing is I've actually never written in first person, really. Um, I gave it a shot a couple of times early on, but for me, when I write first person, I feel like I'm writing a diary entry. Like I can't separate myself from that character when I write in first because I'm saying I and me the whole time and I just it's a cognitive thing I just can't quite get it that way and so I've always used third person to write um it just helps me really see who's who in the in the scenes and really like kind of picture almost like a camera view of the scene like I'm like in there with the camcorder like watching everything happening and so I feel like that's always how I've written I did make a change, though, from Dead in the Dark to um, Where Echoes Die in that I moved to um, Third Present. Oh, Third Present. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that one, I used to write in Third Present a lot. And then the more I read, the more I saw that people don't really do that. And so I, I wrote Dead in the Dark in Third Past, which I really enjoyed. But now looking back, I, I can't go back to writing Third Past. I can't figure out how to do it. I love Third Present because it gives you um, a sense of immediacy but also you can stay a little bit omniscient in third and kind of move around the room a little bit and see what's going on. And so I I wrote Where Echoes Die in third present. I wrote my, my next YA book in third present as well. It just feels like there's a lot more um, movement 
Mm. That when you say someone is doing something, it feels like it's really happening versus they did this feels almost a little more reflective. It does. It's like shocking to me how big a difference it can make, even though it's really like when you break it down, the difference of like just a couple letters on the page. (laughs) Yeah. But the the tone is very different. And I think um, I've read a lot of third past that still has that immediacy and works really well. But just from a writing standpoint, I felt like this is the only way for me to really get people to feel like they're in it with Beck. Mm. So I haven't heard anybody saying that they like were confused on reading it because I can't remember. There's one other book. Oh, um, the Gemma Doyle trilogy by Libba Bray is written in third present. And I remember when I was a kid, when I first like cracked that book open and I was reading it, I didn't understand how to read it because I'd never read a book in third present before. <laughs> um, and now it's all I do. So <laughs> That's really cool. And I like, um, you know, I think it's interesting to move from one to the other or to explore the kind of perspectives that you yeah you write in. Um, Speaking of your next book, would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Because that sounds super cool too. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I am uh, currently in the very home stretch of finishing the draft of it. So fingers crossed. Um, It is a YA, like speculative horror. And this is definitely my most horror-y book of my books so far. Um, about a group of five teens who are enrolled in a wilderness therapy like behavioral program because they've um, they've got various things going on at school at home and their parents decided that they needed to be part of this program. And the program is a 50 day hike through a very remote forest where they will you know do different milestones and achieve things for self-sufficiency and all of that. Um, But early on in the program, something happens and they end up alone in the woods with no help, no guidance and no protection. And they realize quickly that they are surrounded by, I will just call them monsters. I I will not get specific about them. (laughs) And they'll need to make their way out of the woods um, before these monsters catch up with them. And it's my first shot at doing like an ensemble cast. And I've been having an blast with that um and it's also easing away from the um small town with secrets which is my favorite trope but (laughs) one I've done a couple times now so I wanted to do something new um and so it sort of has that um that vibe of like if you ever saw the wilds or like yellow jackets where it's isolation in the woods and the cast is dealing with an external threat but also dealing with their own issues as they're like forced to confront them with the others and with themselves and so it's been a very emotional one to write but I've had a lot of fun with it wow that sounds super cool (laughs) thank you well I hope that uh you know you'll consider maybe coming back to the show to talk about that one when that's absolutely because yeah it's been great to talk to you about this one and I I really look forward to our listeners and our patrons checking this book out Good. I'm so glad. Thank you so much for having me. And I would love to come back to talk about uh, what the woods took as well. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. uh, Listeners, please check out Where Echoes Die. It is absolutely fantastic. And by the time that you hear this episode, it will be out. So check it out at your favorite independent bookstore or library. This has been Jen in conversation with Courtney Gould. (laughs) <laughs> thank you so much for joining us Courtney it is now time you. to close this chapter it's time to close this chapter of turn the page join us for the next episode